Hello. Thank you all very much for uh, for coming along to this uh, the latest the latest installment of the Pulses Department seminar series. It's a pleasure to welcome such a uh, such a large uh, a large group of our students, particularly here today for this talk. Um, Earlier in the course of our, our seminar series this year, it gave me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Drew Futter, uh, who was the first of my own PhD students to make it through uh, uh, the, uh, the cycle. Today, uh, the cycle of life, as it were, in academia comes to Birmingham because I'm introducing yeah. my own former PhD student, <laughs> Professor Michael Cox from the London School of Economics. He's a man who has lived many lives in the course of academia. Um, Stop now. Being, uh, being fans, of course, of the perpetual revolution uh, at Birmingham, we will be glad to know that he has a background in Trotskyism originally, uh, and also the, uh, the Irish Republican Army via a long stay, and not as a member, as a scholar, <laughs> via a long stay at the Queen's University of Belfast. Oh God, Since which time he has gone on to be uh, one of, if not the foremost expert uh, in the United States and its foreign policy operating within the United Kingdom. He's worked at two of the leading international relations departments in the UK, which is to say Aberystwyth and the London School of Economics, which is a bit like playing for two of the biggest clubs in the Premier League, uh, luckily with more success on both fronts than Fernando Torres. Um, <laughs> he's also had a number of excellent jobs. Uh, he's been chair of the European Consortium on Political Research. He's been chair of the US discussion group at Chatham House. Uh, he is the founding director um, of the uh, Centre for International Affairs, Diplomacy and Strategy, otherwise known as LSC Ideas, at the London School of Economics. Uh, and he's also been the editor of a variety of journals, including the Review of International Studies, International Relations and International Politics. Somehow, in the midst of all of this, he has also found time to publish an array of scholarship uh, over a course of decades um, on a number of topics. Uh, including the Cold War and the Soviet Union, uh, American Empire, which many people who have reading lists on any of my courses will have come across, uh, and these days on the topic of American decline, uh, a subject on which I've had uh, many disagreements with him, but of the enjoyable sort that enable you to uh, disagree without being disagreeable with one of your friends and colleagues in front of audiences back and forth. Um, uh, always, as you would expect from his interest in the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, a fan of a superpower, um, he is now developing his research interest into the realm of China, uh, which many, of course, see as a rising force in the world today. One of the advantages of knowing Mick as a supervisor and as a colleague is that wherever you went in the world, in the United States, in Europe, or anywhere else, uh, you, would be, uh, you would be asked if you knew Mick, and then when you said yes, they would nod their, nod their, heads, <laughs> nod their heads stage and go, yes. Him, right? <laughs> Everybody knows Mick. Uh, it is true that almost everybody knows Mick, uh, but not quite, and that's why it gives me great pleasure today uh, to be able to introduce him to just that few people more at the University of Birmingham. Therefore, I give to you Professor Michael Cox. I might as well give up now after that. Uh, I, I'm trying to work out what the philosophy of Birmingham University is. And this kind of Maoist slogan is along the wall. Uh, the Chinese have got rid of them, and Birmingham University seems to have introduced them. It's um, love life, love to challenge, learning. This is, this is pure pure post-Maoism. Um, well, it's, it's interesting to teach at a post-Maoist institution. I see Ronan Palin at the back there as well. Um, okay, I mean, what I'm going to... My argument today, it, it put it in essence, in, in simplest terms, is that there is a new narrative which I'll kind of outline to you, which suggests very strongly and increasingly that there is a power shift taking place. And I'll outline that. Um, I, I'll outline the reasons why that argument is made, and I'll suggest some of the reasons why I think it's problematic. And then at the end, I'm going to suggest uh, some, some consequences of buying into what people now call the power shift argument. That's the kind of thesis. Um, it isn't that I deny change, it is that I think maybe I'm still very much more Trotskyist and certainly not a member of the Irish Republican Army. Never was, by the way, just in case. Um, maybe I was very much influenced by Susan Strange and notions of structural power. And I think it's just as important to kind of work out what the conditions of structural power are as much as it is important to identify the sources of change. Power has a very great capacity to hang on to what it's got, uh, like ruling classes. Um, and that's, in some sense, is, I suppose, what I'm really also going to try and argue. That those who have power don't give it up easily. Those who have it have certain major structural advantages. 
and they're not easily overcome. And I think quite a lot of the discussion, largely led by economists, but not only, over the last few years about a power shift, the rise of China, all the rest of it, the rise of the BRICS, the rise of the rest, to use the term by Fareed Zakaria. I, I think much of that obviously touches on something real, uh, but I think it misses something really equally real and maybe equally important, namely what remains important in terms of structural power within the international order. It's not an argument for the status quo, by the way. Uh, no great interest in either the status quo or change, personally, but uh, it is simply trying to call things by, by, the real, by their real name. Now, the, f the first point I want to make, and that's, that's the outline, the first point I want to make is a bit of a cliché, uh, that the... <laughs> It may not be a cliche in Birmingham, but, uh, but the, the last 10 years have been extraordinarily turbulent ones, I mean, given the confidence that the West had after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the era of globalisation. Um, the West had won Francis Fukuyama, seemed like a serious individual, though I can't imagine why. Um, no, the last 10 years have been a, a delivered what some would call a profound challenge to that optimism to that hubris uh, which was clearly there immediately after the collapse of actually existing socialism, the alternative uh, planning had failed, market had succeeded uh, globalisation drove all before it American power seemed permanently prime and primed for primacy uh, unipolarity was not only going to last for a moment it was going to last for an era people were writing about the new American century, the 21st century, being as much American as it would as the 20th was. What the last 10 years have done, just to quickly sum up, and again, I'm, I'm generalising like mad, but it's quite difficult to simplify, by the way. Um, what the last 10 years have done have, I think, altered at least the ways that a lot of people now look at what looked like a permanent reality, a permanent reality at least by, by the end of the 1990s just at four levels, what has changed, what has made the last 10 years t turbulent and changed all our assumptions from the 1990s, four things, there are a number of other things as well. The first thing clearly is, is, the, is the role of the United States at the heart of this. Um, it, it, be it begins with Bush's, uh, Bush's constitutional coup d'etat uh, in 2000, which it essentially was. It continues with the disaster that turned out to be Iraq, which was most, it's the only thing I've actually predicted and got right. Uh, over the last 10 years. The only other prediction I got right was I'd be older 10 years later, 10 years older later. I got that right as well. But I got the Iraq war right. And uh, it was amazing actually how many people said it would go wrong and it went wrong. You know, it's probably the only thing that IR probably and realists have got right over the last <laughs> 25 years, maybe. And of course, that loss of prestige, you know, that then was reinforced then by this extraordinary financial crisis which nearly everybody did not predict, particularly economists at the London School of Economics. Um, so you started with Bush, you ended up with a war on terror that frankly nobody believed in, you ended up with a war which everybody predicted would go badly wrong and it went wrong, and then towards the end of Bush's second term you end up with an extraordinary financial crisis. The front page of popular magazine, I think Time said it was the decade from hell. Well, you wouldn't have said that in 2000, but you could say that by 2009, 2010. Uh, the, second, the second change, of course, and a huge change, really, and it's still ongoing, and all these things are ongoing, of course, is the European Union. Um, now, as a collector of weird books, one or two of which I've read, and a few that I've written, um, quite interesting to kind of look at the literature on the European Union at the end of the 1990s and going back to 2000, 2001. People like Charlie Kupchen at an academic level, other writers as well. But basically predicting, you know, the 21st century would be the European century. Um, you know, it, it had negotiated its way through the end of the Cold War, it had managed German unification. German unification had, in a sense, finally been completed through the economic integration of the East. There had then been the increasing enlargement of the European Union, the enlargement of NATO, but the enlargement of the Union in particular. We'd gone through Maastricht, we'd come up to common foreign and security policy, ESDP, San Marlo, blah, 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 the Euro ends. What? Although the, 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 the 1990s clearly had some problems for the European Union, former Yugoslavia being the obvious one, 
Nonetheless, at the end of the 1990s, there was a sense that the European, the European project was not only on track, but that Europe would be re redefining international relations in very critical ways. And, and that the euro could easily even come to replace, or at least sit alongside the dollar, and the European values, normative power, to use that term by Ian Manners, would, in a sense, become a, a, a most important form of new power. Well, that kind of narrative of optimism about the European Union, I don't need to go into too much detail about, about that. Um, I don't think the European Union is going to disintegrate. I think, you know, to use a phrase, it's too big to fail. Um, and it's too big for Germany to fail, by the way. And Germany needs the European Union, like every <laughs> the great the great winner out of the European Union, in my opinion, clearly apart from the, most Europeans, or some Europeans, has been Germany. Uh, but it, it ended with you know even serious people arguing about its possible disintegration. In other words, the two key props of the, what we call the West, you know, have gone from a period of real optimism about their futures to a, to a moment of real, real pessimism about the future. That then leads to the third point, really, of the huge change in the turbulence over the last ten years. Um, Globalized global capitalism, um, the, core, the core areas of global capitalism. I mean, globalization is clearly not failed. I mean, trade goes on, foreign direct investment goes on, um, all the various aspects of global capitalism, which a number of people in this room have written about offshoring, all that goes on. It isn't about to collapse, and it's certainly not about to be replaced. There doesn't seem to be an alternative. It's not like the 1930s. But, but nonetheless, there's clearly been a crisis of it. <laughs> if you like these old Trotskyists I used to know, uh, <laughs> they kept talking about the crisis of capitalism in the 60s, it didn't happen. They talked about it in the 70s, it didn't happen. Talked about it in the 1980s, it certainly didn't happen then. They certainly didn't talk about it in the 1990s. Then suddenly it comes along, the only trouble is that most of the old Trots are so damned old now, they can't do anything about it. Um, but it is, I think it is a genuine crisis, so in some fundamental sense, of some, some parts of the capitalist world. Um, <laughs> you've got to be right once. The only trouble is, by the time you got to 75, uh, I'm not 75, by the way. You know, but you, once you get to, you know, you can't. You, you've been talking about it for so long. It's not just crying wolf three times; it's almost like crying wolf ten times. And finally, it does happen. By that time, you know, you've got false teeth and you're drawing a pension. Um, but nonetheless, it, it it has created. There's no doubt about it. I mean, and 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 and, and its ongoing character has obviously created a real sense of uh, a sense of crisis. You know, that sense of confidence in the United States, in the European Union, at least in the core areas of the Western world, have, that has gone. Um, and even the model of capitalism, which was, was popularized through the 80s and generalized through the 90s, 90s through globalization, free market capitalism, if you wish, um, that is clearly under sustained attack. Again, it isn't going to lead to planning. Nobody's going to kind of argue for five-year plans. They don't even argue for Keynesianism now, <laughs> um, in any real sense. But nonetheless, it, there's been a profound kind of sense of crisis which has led to this. The, the fourth and final part of what I call the decade of turbulence, or the decade from hell, the huge change compared to the 1990s, is, is simply this notion of emerging economies. I kind of tried to trace the history of this notion of emerging economy. I never quite knew what it meant. Um, because I used to use a word like third world, which I'm now told is deeply on, deeply on, well, it doesn't, doesn't carry, is inaccurate really. You know. And anyway, you can't have a third world unless you've got a first and a second world. So, you know, if you don't have capitalism and communism, you can't have a third one. You know, first and second, you need a third. Mathematical genius. Um, but obviously, it, it also argues about new kinds of economies or old style economies which have finally, finally, finally begun to emerge after being presumably underdeveloped permanently if you take the old, some of the old theories of dependency. What has happened here very quickly again is that people are no longer talking about emerging economies they're now beginning to, the, the, the language has moved to talking about rising powers Been quite, quite an interesting shift but in the 1990s, economies were emerging. Now, these emerging economies are now, in a sense, segued or morphed into something we now begin to call rising powers, which, in a sense, gives them far more, far more significance and weight in the international system. Anyway, adding all these things together about the United States, the European Union, the nature of global capitalism, and what I call the segue of emerging economies to something more than emerging economies. Not emerge, but <laughs> nonetheless rising, rather than emerging, if you like, and powers, rather than just economies. All this has created, I'm sure you're all aware, and I won't, belay, I won't labour the point, it's created a new narrative. Um, now, 
whether this is a consensus is, is you know, up for debate a bit. But I do think there is now, amongst a lot of writers, economists and others, there is a, a kind of new narrative that what, what effectively we're in now is the, sec- you know, the second big power transition of the last 20 years. The first big tra- power transition occurred when the Soviet Union collapsed. That was, in a sense, a transition from what we used to call a bipolar world to a unipolar world. That was a power transition. The end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union was a kind of form of a power transition. Clearly it was. Um, what people are now talking about, in a sense, the second, what I'm talking about anyway, what some others talk about, of course, is the second power transition. In other words, that world which was d- d- emerged from the end of the Cold War and, and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of Germany and the overcoming of the division of Europe, all those things taken together, that is now moving into something else. And there's a new literature, which I, I don't know if you want to call it, I don't know how to characterise it, there's no single literature. And indeed, there are different nuances in this debate. There's not one kind of way of looking at this. There are different schools of thought within this. But within that broad camp, within that broad camp, I think there is a kind of an argument that the West, as traditionally understood, will no longer be running the world in the same way that it has been running it for the last 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years. I mean, that, that's all over the place. You can't get away from it. Um, Paul Kennedy, uh, who I, I rather like in many ways, um, both personally as a scholar, I mean, he wrote about the rise and fall of the great powers. If you remember back in 1987, sold millions of books on the back of it, got translated into uh, 327 languages. Um, and, and, and the book, of course, as everybody then argued after, was, was wrong. <laughs> because although powers in general may rise and fall, the United States didn't. And so people are now saying, well, Paul Ferguson was right 20 years early. You know, the train is coming to the station finally 20 years later. The rise and fall of the great powers is narrow. There's a shift to Asia. He's written about this. Indeed, as an historian, you know, he takes the long view and says, well, actually, we're going back to normal. This is what it was like in the 15th century, anyway. That's when Asia was far more significant. You know, our Eurocentric view of the world should lead us not to be so surprised by this. Uh, another historian who I also know, but like a little less, uh, Neil Ferguson. Um, of course, ten years ago, Neil Ferguson was kind of asking the Americans to put on piss helmets and um, learn, learn how to run empires, just like the British, as you remember. The only problem with the American empire was the Americans didn't know they had one. And if only they could have learned from the British better, they would know how to run one. Um, the book actually wasn't as bad as some of the slogans, but nonetheless. Ferguson has now turned into kind of a modern Scottish Spengler. Uh, if you remember Oswald Spengler in the 1920s, kind of talked about the decline of the West, and it's all going to pot, and it's the end of everything. Spengler, of course, was very much responding to the Bolshevik Revolution and the post-war situation. But Ferguson has become what I call the new Scottish Spengler. You know, full of gloom and doom about the West, it's all over. The Columbus moment is done. It's, it's, it's all done. You know, you've got to give up. You know, kind of go, go to Harvard and then shout, shout rude words at the British um, or, the, or the English. Um, there's also a sense within this transitional debate that the transatlantic is no longer the axis around which the world or- rotates. That's part of it as well. That's part of the argument as well. If you like, the transatlantic world, which gave us, if you like, world history in some senses from the 15th, 16th century onwards. I mean, you might want to debate that, I know, but you know, making that an open generalisation. But the transatlantic world, in a sense, is no longer as important or central to the world. Uh, that's also part of this argument, I think. There's a kind of geographical shift taking place. Um, the rest, uh, to use the term by... Farid Zakaria are on the march. Now, the term the rest, um, <laughs> it's not exactly precise, <laughs> if you think about it. You know. um, it was coined by, uh, I think, Zakaria in, in that book of his on post American world. And a lot of people are taking it up. I know John Eikenberry has written about it, kind of taking it up. Other people might prefer the acronym BRICS Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, you know, just to be imprecise, some people then say it's not the rest, it's not the BRICS, it's Asia which is on the rise, or it's the East, or something like that. It's very imprecise what people think it's transitioning to. Is it, is it an acronym? Is it Asia? Is it the East? Or whatever. But everybody thinks that something else is happening elsewhere in the world, and it ain't happening, if you like, within the European Union and the United States in the traditional Western world. I mean, that's what they're arguing. You know, every, everything is moving forward in Brazil and everything else, or, or, or in, in China or in Asia. 
um, but it's not happening else. In other words, the rest, of ch- the rest is kind of redefining the rest of, the, of what the world would look like in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And then, of course, that, that comes back to a final point, really, as uh, Adam put it earlier. And I'll come back to this in, later in the talk on, uh, on the question of the United States. Um, now, not everybody thinks the United States is in decline. Adam, of course, thinks it's declining gently, just like the British Empire. Um, a, a lot of people don't like to use the word decline. They, they kind of you, like, they prefer different kinds of words to describe what they're talking about. Um, they might even use the word multipolarity. You know, we've left the unipolar world behind to become multipolar, which is, in a sense, another way of saying it, actually. It just means the United States has less control over agendas, less definition of the world, has fewer followers, as Barry Buzan put it in an article in International Politics, uh, just a plug, um, and that effectively we are not going to move into American century, we are since living in a post-American world. Now, how bad it is going to be for the United States remains, you know, you can either kind of take the kind of gloom and doom view that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of Ottoman Empire moment, as in 1918, sort of collapse around you. Or you could take it's a very long, relative, slow decline, or it's more rapid. But a combination of debt, a combination of deficits, a failure in Iraq, um, and all the rest uh, adds up to something really quite... In other words, it's, 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 it's finally true. <laughs> you know, people have been predicting this for 30 years, including me, by the way. Um, and it's finally come to bed. Now, at the heart of this argument, too, and, and, and putting all, all that and adding that together, still there's one final variable. I don't know if it's an independent one or a dependent one, I don't care. But there's one other variable in all of this, of course, which is China. I mean, actually, I think all of this could be consumed easily enough if you didn't throw in the emergence of China over the last 10 years, or the last five years, however much you want to put it to one side. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't kind of write anything, as I found it, without adding the word empire in. Um, now, nobody wants to read anything except unless it's got the word China in, you know, so Birmingham and China. Um, the world and China, Japan, and you know, China has become, in a sense, the new, the new buzz. Um, and the question then becomes, not is China rising, but how far it has risen, and how much further will it rise into the future? Now, that then has generated a massive debate about China. I mean, I can only participate in this as a, non, a non-China speaker. And I, I'm, I'm a kind of definition of a genuine China expert. I travel there once a year. I speak to four Chinese people every six months, and I don't know the language. <laughs> so I've become one of these instant China experts, so don't believe anything I'm now going to say. But, I mean, following the debate even in the English language, it, it, there are some very interesting questions which are, have emerged around this. Can China rise peacefully or not? Um, the Chinese themselves have actually constructed a new theory of themselves called a peaceful rise. This, of course, was to offset the argument that a rise, in, a rise of a great populist state, populated state like China would inevitably lead to a new threat. So it was a deliberate attempt to construct, deconstruct the notion of China's threat. And this, was, this goes back really to the late 1990s. So that goes back some time. The next question becomes what are supposed to be the grand strategy of the United States? I mean, if I've gone to any conferences on this and fallen asleep so many times listening to this stuff, but it all gets back to can you socialise China into the international order a la English school, or do you have to contain it uh, a la kind of more realist view of it? Uh, but the figures are, by any stretch of imagination, impressive. You can't but be impressed. Uh, the growth figures themselves, whether it's 10.4, 9.8, 7.6, or whatever, I don't know, don't care really. Th- that, that looks impressive. It's also the impact that China has had. Again, I, I don't want to belabor the point, because I'm sure most of you read more about this than I'm about to, information I'm about to divulge. But the impact has been impressive. I mean, Brazil, now number one trading partner, happens to be China. Africa, the role of China in Africa has now become a kind of a minor industry <laughs> for people writing about Chinese foreign policy and, and there are now one million Chinese citizens working in, in Africa, not just companies operating. But its impact on its own region of course has been huge, it's now J- Japan's largest trading partner, you can go on and on and on. The one, the one case study I always use, which may be, may be peculiarly British I suppose, is Australia. I, I do travel to Australia uh, at least once a year after I got over the jet lag, which takes about four weeks. Um, going down to Australia last year to Melbourne, I was teaching at La Trobe, and I, was really, I kind of got very much 
So I actually was not entirely aware of how much the, the rise of China and Chinese economic demand for the kinds of things that Australia generates and produces had had such an impact on Australia. I was really quite unaware of it. I mean, I kind of knew about Africa in general terms. I knew about Brazil and knew about its own region. But I, I, was, I was slightly unaware of its impact on a country like Australia. Um, but, but its impact has just absolutely been huge. Absolutely huge. I mean, the two, the two most successful economic states in, in Australia, of course, Queensland and Western Australia, they provide an enormous amount of stuff. The trade, the trade levels between Australia and China. Actually, Australia is now the most dependent country in the world on China. You know, percentage terms. So the actual significant growth of Australia, which everybody keeps talking about, by the way, is actually very China dependent, as far as I could actually see, from what I was looking at. Because large parts of the Australian economy are deeply inefficient, by the way, um, and deeply uncompetitive. But the, the Chinese demand has made a huge difference to to Australia, and you can add up other other kind of less consequential, but nonetheless not insignificant impacts of Chinese demand on the world economy. I mean, for instance, on German manufacturing, been a huge. Um, French best wine, which I'm going to drink later on tonight, I hope, yeah. if your budget goes to it. <laughs> um, 30% now of the best wines in Bordeaux go to, go to Hong Kong. They go to Shanghai. This is quite significant. The rise of a new billionaire, millionaire, middle class is but having a significant impact on prices of Bordeaux which is why I'm going to drink one of them tonight. Um, you can go on and on and on. Danny Quar at the LSE has done this study on um, whether the, the extent to which... How, how do you account for global growth, insofar as there's been global growth, over the last two to three years? And his argument is, I'm, I'm only using him, I haven't done any work myself on this, you know, any, uh, any originality, is that much of this derives from demand from China. You know, so when you're looking at commodity prices rising, the amount of cement that China's using, the amount of steel it's demanding, all these kind of things, it's really it's China, which has made, which has actually kept, has been the engine of the world economy, um, in many, in many important respects, all of which have been positive for capitalism. So you know, we need a communist party running capitalism in China in order to keep capitalism going everywhere else in the world. Um, and indeed, as you've seen over the last few months. A desperation by European elites to try and get China to buy European debt, which of course they're not likely to do very, very much soon. But again, it gives you some indication of this kind of increasing importance of, of China. And you could add to that argument about China all sorts of other kind of incidentals, but they're not insignificant. Obama has, how many times I don't know, but Obama has been characterised as the first Asian president in the sense that his main interest isn't the transatlantic, isn't Europe, certainly isn't Britain given what he did to his father. Um, it is essentially Asia. I mean, that's partly in his own biography, but it's also partly in his own orientation. Um, there's a recent article by Hillary Clinton, um, not refereed, I suppose, wouldn't get in the REF, uh, therefore of great importance, um, unlike most of the REF stuff, let's be blunt. Um, but in, in, in the article, uh, Secretary of State Clinton was arguing the whole point about an Asian century and the role of China at the heart of that, and why America is reorienting towards Asia, I mean, or, or particularly reorienting towards, towards China. There's been a big shift in US public opinion, or at least a shift, a big shift, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but it's been a shift. You know, in 2003-04, Americans were saying, who are our best friends, what's the most important part of the world? Well, it's Europe. You know, the French, the Germans, the Brits, and all the other things, you know, the European Union. Now, 2011, German Marshall Fund, Pew, as well as others, show... U.S. public opinion is showing greater, much greater notion that Asia is more important to America. Now, Asia both as possibility and China as threat. It's quite interesting. Actually, there's an interesting division between the Europeans and the Americans on this. The Americans do see it more as threat in public discourse, whereas Europeans don't. I mean, they see it in different ways, a large economic. So, this is the kind of narrative. I'm, I think it's the background of what I'm trying to argue is. Today. Now, all of these things in more general terms, before I get on to what I want to say, I think all these things have terrific interest for IR more, more generally. I mean, we're just bringing out the IR side of this a bit more. Um, I, you know, just kind of thinking about this on, you know, wh why should we in IR be interested in any of this? Well, it's, it's very important. Uh, <laughs> not that that's ever uh, stimulated IR, I and mean, sometimes IR has studied the most trivial things in the world and thought of them as being important, where nobody else in the world actually did. 
But there seems to be there's an enormous number of ways in which this is not only important, but is interesting and important for IR. One, of course, it gets to the very heart of the question of change. What kind of change it's going to be? I mean, after all, there's somebody who's kind of written you know, voluminously and forever and ever and ever about E.H. Carr. If you read the 20 years crisis, I mean, the whole point there is looking at is the problem of peaceful change. What actually happens when the status quo changes? And that, that was the fundamental question he was really trying to drive at. And his, his argument, of course, in the 20 years crisis, that if you don't get peaceful, if you don't get change right, if you don't identify the sources of change, if you don't deal with the, the, the causes of change correctly, you're going to end up with some very dangerous situations, and namely war. Of course, Nat, he argued for appeasement of Germany. Dodge, a dodgy policy, but you could see where he was coming from. And so it does get into the whole issue of change. And the IR, obviously, in realism, realism in IR, has often been, called, been accused of not being very good at change. Um, and so I think a lot of people in IR are jumping on the change bandwagon, if I might put it like that, because they don't want to be left behind by history, I suppose, in some ways. You know, I mean, realism was accused back in 89 of being so consumed with the status quo of the Cold War that it got, it didn't understand change and therefore didn't predict the end of the Cold War. And I wonder if that's not also playing into this a little bit as well. We got change wrong before, we ain't going to get it wrong again. But even if you think we're right or wrong on this, realism in particular, nonetheless there is a fundamental issue of change. It is also a great place, secondly, to test different theories of IR. I mean, if you want to test out your liberal integrationism or your um, Organsky theories of, pe or, of power transition, all your mere shimmy and offensive realist arguments, this is the place to go. Quite actually marvellous to see Organsky back in, back in fashion. I mean, here, I, th I thought, the guy thought, well, I know he's dead, but I thought he was intellectually dead as well. I thought nobody ever read this guy. World politics, back 1958. Now he's all over the place. Uh, not him personally, his ideas, of course. <laughs> if he was all over the place, we would have problems. I have to start believing in God. Um, but... In, I mean, yeah, in Organsky's argument is really oh, it's a fascinating one, really. I mean, I don't, it, it may be right in the late 18th century, I'm not sure it's right today. But Organsky's, so there's a lot of kind of ways in which this, these changes are pulling out a lot of ideas and, and the theories of change. With Mearsheimer on the one hand saying when hegemons rise, it's bound to lead to conflict, blah, blah, blah. Liberal integration saying no, we can socialise. English school people, of course, got in on this. Barry Buzan can't keep out of China now. You know, spreading the good word on the English School of Integration and Socialization, doing a great job. Not sure they're believing him all, but you know, they're doing, he's doing his best, I'll bear it. And then you've got Organsky sitting in the background. So it's a great place for testing a series of theories. Uh, all of this, particularly on the role of China, but not only on that. Um, regionalism is another area where we can kind of go into this. It's also a test of the liberal order. Can it hold? I mean, clearly, one of the things which is emerging out of this new debate is there's a new form of authoritarian capitalism which actually works better than democratic capitalism. So that's also part of an interest. Varieties of capitalism's kind of argument as well. You can draw that out of this debate in, in some respects as well. Um, it's also been an enormous test, it seems to me, for two sets of writers. Firstly, I think it's been an enormous test actually for a lot of American writers who bought into or accepted almost without thinking unipolarity theories. I mean, and this wasn't just argued by realists, of course, it was argued by liberals like Eikenberry, as much as it was argued by, by, by <coughs> Bill Walforth. And of course, this, this new world, or if this new world is emerging, and I'm not, I'll, I'll go on to talk about that in a moment, but it's certainly a big test for them. I, I think John Eikenberry, a guy I, I admire quite a lot, actually, as you know, I know personally very well, I think John's been having a torrid time <laughs> trying to deal with all this, really. Because he's trying to fit it into a kind of liberal framework which also accepts the theory of primacy and the theory of unipolarity. And I think he's having great difficulty trying to hold the whole thing together. Um, it's also been finally, I think, been a terrible, t extraordinarily difficult test for what I would call Europeanists. You know, all those who have been integrated into, literally, <laughs> into the kind of whole European Union project, intellectually and academically. Um, I think, you know, so at some point, somebody ought to write, I mean, and maybe no doubt somebody will, um, you know, an argument about why is it that so many of those who are academically and intellectually in, involved in the study of the European Union um, simply didn't see this crisis coming, actually. Uh, I, mean, I don't want to kind of you know, throw stones at decent people, I'm not trying to do that, but I mean, 
I, 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 I'm not a specialist on the EU, or European integration, the Europeanisation debate, but all the kind of intellectual tools it seems to be that most EU people in our area kind of deployed and employed and used, you know, are simply, simply we're not prepared for the kind of, you know, the tsunami which has hit the European Union over the over the last two to over the last two years, I think. You know, so I think it's been a huge. It could be a huge test. A bit like what, I, what the test that IR went through, you know, with the end of the Cold War. I do think it's going to it's going to have to shake things up considerably because there was this kind of Whig interpret Whig history. It was getting better and would always tend to get better. You know, it would move forward in the liberal direction, and you know, it's it's hit it's hit the rails. I've just come back from a couple of conferences involving quite a lot of German colleagues uh, and politicians, and you know, they don't sound terribly Europeanized when they refer to Greece to me. You know. Uh, they, they sound quite the reverse. There's a, there's some, we should make sure the Greeks know what their feet are doing. Their feet are close up against that fire. Um, it's just kind of, you know, pour de courager les autres. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's some, fearsome, some fearsome stuff out there, really, now in the European discourse. And it doesn't sound very European. You know, I mean, let's be blunt about it. It doesn't sound very... So it's an interesting and difficult time for IR. Now, my... My intervention, really, uh, which I'll take the next say, 15, 20 minutes, maybe I spent too long on the first part, but I think I needed to set the argument up. My interventions were a rather different character, because I'm having out, outlined what I think is the general consensus, this kind of argument about power shift and transitions and all the rest of it, the decline of the West and the rise of the East and all that. Um, I suppose what I want to do, maybe it's for, it's, it's kind of in my character to be contrarian, and inevitably so, I suppose, but nothing wrong with that, um, is in a way not to accept the given that we are in the middle of an irreversible shift, not to accept that, but rather to see what are the sources of continued structural power. That's what I'm kind of interested in trying to do. Not because I want to deny change, go back to what I'm saying, or even to suggest that I'm in favour of the status quo forever. I want to stop China rising up. What, what difference does it make if I don't like it? Who cares what I think? Um, I just want to kind of maybe raise questions that status quo powers and power itself has a great capacity for endurance. Uh, I think it's actually quite a radical argument in a way. Uh, not a conservative one. I mean, I think some people have taken what I've said as being rather conservative. It's not really. I think quite radical. Because trying to argue that there are kind of, well, as I said at the beginning, I think there are some very deep structural sources of power. And, under, undercutting power, which has already been possessed by powerful states and powerful systems, is very actually damn difficult. It doesn't just happen, you know, because certain writers, you know, in Singapore like Mabubani, or because certain economists notice that there's production going on in China, or because Brazil's living standards are rising, or because India has now got a big steel industry. You know, I, I suppose in a sense, what I'm also trying to argue, and I, I, I did this at Aberystwyth a bit more than elsewhere, is that the um, in a way, we've got to take all this debate away from the economists. <laughs> uh, that's, I suppose, part of what I'm really trying to argue for. Indeed, when I actually, and I'll talk about this in a minute, actually, I think some of the economists have also got it wrong. I, mean, I say this as a non economist, but you know, ever since the economists got everything wrong back in you know, three, four years ago, <laughs> still getting it wrong. Um, I think you can be completely confident about saying anything you like about the economy without even being an economist. I think we've got to take it away from the economists. I want to make a number of arguments, and let me just outline very quickly, Adam, and then we can uh, move it forward. Um, firstly, I mean, it's simply the, the basic premise. I mean, how far has there, in fact, been a massive, as Danny Kwa, as Mabu Barney, as Martin Wolf, as any op-ed piece, all the rest of them say, how far actually has there been a massive economic shift of power, as has been claimed? I mean, that's my first question. Um, now again, I cover this as a non-economist. Okay, all I did was ask myself a question. You know, it, just taking it in its own terms, how far has it gone? Now, of course, you may say in 25 years' time it will then have gone. And, you know, but I can't work with 25 year timelines. I really can't. I don't think anybody else can either. By the way, um, if we take, for instance, each of the bricks, which has been much debated, but that's ever since Goldman Sachs popularised the concept back in 2001. It's a pretty daft concept. I mean, it's not even a concept. It's simply an acronym to make sure that Goldman Sachs uh, were able to set up offices in Brazil, Russia, India, and China, I think. But 
But it has, it has travelled, this concept of the BRICS. It's kind of encapsulated in an acronymic form what people understand to be this power shift, even if it's much wider and larger than that, I mean, incorporating Asia. Well, if you take each one of those, well, Russia, to, to take the first one, or the second one, Russia is only a commodity power, and I'm not sure that therefore constitutes the beginning of a new power shift constituting part of Russia. Brazil is certainly impressive, but vast areas of Brazil are, are, are racked by social stress and strain, high levels of criminality, enormous poverty, by the way, and vast inequalities, uh, and, and, and those inequalities are growing. If one takes India, again, I'm just giving quick you know, bullet points just to kind of raise sceptical skept thoughts in your mind. Take India. Half a billion of its citizens, about 1.2 billion people thereabout, you know, live in actually abject poverty. Still, still, where two dollars a day actually would be relatively, you'd be doing pretty damn well. Um, a colleague of mine now at the LSE, Ramachandra Guha, has written a wonderful, gave a wonderful lecture, ten reasons why, the United, why India will not become and should not become a superpower. But one of the reasons he gave, one of the, fund, two of the fundamental reasons he gave was simply looking at the fundamental economics uh, of, of, of India. Um, China, of course, has impressive growth, but from a very low basis. Uh, and living standards, on average, are about 10, about 10 to 15 percent of those in the West. In other words, per capita income, I mean, yeah, terrific growth, and no doubt a lot of cities are being transformed and large urban conurbations are coming into being. But nonetheless, in terms of simply GDP, GDP, GDP capita, per capita income, living standards, in other words, still got a very long way to go. It has created many millionaires and many billionaires, and there's a new middle class emerging, no doubt about it. But within that framework, there's still an enormous amount, an enormous long way to go. I also talk of what I call the Goldman, what I call the Goldman Sachs fallacy. The Goldman Sachs fallacy can be very simply summarised. That is to make projections into the future based on assumptions that things will continue to go on year in, year out, year on, year in, year out for the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years. You know, it's a unilinear projection going forward. That's how Goldman Sachs does it. If you look at that original 2001, and then the relative decline of the West is built into that, and the relative rise of the rest, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and many others are built into that, and Mexico and Indonesia, you can throw those into the pot as well, South Africa too, if you want to kind of extend the BRICS to BRICSA. Um, again, all I can say, uh, based on what we know of what has happened to economies in the past, including our own economists in particular, is that those kinds of unilinear projections forward, uh, which assume either one side going down or the other side continually going up, seems to be fallacious, highly problematic. And it says betting, betting your shirt, effectively, intellectually, on projections over 10, 15, 20, 25 years, which is simply not guaranteed at all. I mean, let's not forget that in 2005 and 2006, what most economists and what most policymakers, including those at the Federal Reserve in the United States, were saying about the future of American capitalism. Or remember what people were saying back in 2003 about the future of the European Union. You know, these were projections forward. <laughs> um, and look what's happened since 2007 and 2008. And without going into any too much detail, it does seem to me that making kind of long-term deterministic projections based upon assumptions that these economies, uh, the BRICS and many others, will continue to grow, develop, and ultimately, in, in, some, in some arguments, completely overtake the world, seems to me highly, highly problematic. Just highly problematic. Um, and I, it's really quite surprising that people would fall for this one. But given all the problems that, that, that economies have had in the past, of sustaining growth. After all, even in the 1980s, a lot of people were saying the Soviet economy, in spite of its problems, would actually continue to muddle along. That's how people projected the Soviet economy in the 1980s, by the way. Nobody was saying in the 1980s, I noticed for, <laughs> I noticed because I was around in these debates, nobody was saying in the 1980s the Soviet economy was about to collapse, by the way. Nobody said that. Oh, you know, maybe one or two, but they were completely irrelevant to the central debate on the Soviet Union. You know, and within what? Within three years, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, policy preferences, Gorbachev's mistakes, I know. Nonetheless, he wasn't overdetermined, but nonetheless, the same things have to be applied. I mean, the 1990s a period of growth, but then we got the 1998 financial crisis. Um, you know, <laughs> we thought we were doing really well coming out post 9-11, the cheap money and all the rest of it, which was, by the way, very much a response to 9-11, uh, and a fear of a recession, by the way. 
But nonetheless, by the time we got to 2006 7 we're talking about the greatest housing crisis in history. We're attacking the notion of cheap money and credit, and now we are where we are today. So I don't know quite why all the assumptions about the, the BRICS, we should suspend all judgment. And it does seem to me, to a very large extent, we have. To a very large extent, uh, we have. There are other issues I just want to raise, and these are again sceptical questions, and I'm not sure they lead to any great theoretical conclusion as to where I think the world is now, but all I'm doing is raising these issues because I think they need to be raised. Let me just take the question of power as represented by knowledge, uh, which some people might find that's kind of a strange thing for me to be talking about because I don't talk about this very often. But one of the things I try to look at in terms of trying to make these assessments of is there a power transition? It's kind of asking, I'm bound to ask this question because I work in a higher, higher education and have done so for 105 years um, uh, and may not do very much longer, but um, I kind of take these things rather seriously. And so I spent really two of the most boring afternoons of my life going through statistics on rankings of, in, uh, in, of higher education institutions around the world. It really was not the sort of thing I normally do, and certainly not on, on, you know, on sunny afternoons. Um, but one thing that actually comes out of that, if you take the BRICS in terms... Now, you might say that all this is just Eurocentric Western, but they kind of take about 25 criteria. You know, research, impact, student quality, jobs, they, you know, all the kinds of things. Okay. But it does seem to be a rather important measure of power, actually, in, in some ways. Well, what's quite interesting, if you take the BRICS... <laughs> and I'll ask you to you know, read into this what you want. I mean, Brazil has no institution of higher education internationally measured in the top 100. <coughs> not one. It's got no doubt some good universities doing all sorts of other things. But at international measurement, it's not there. Uh, Russia has absolutely none. Uh, India has none. Well, that's quite strange. Um, China has five, yeah, according to the, this you know, international measurements of higher education. Three are in Hong Kong, which I don't need to remind you, it was run by the British until 1997. Two, two are in Beijing, uh, that's Beida and Xinhua. Again, there's been an enormous amount of discussion about how much patent <coughs> work is now being done in China. And, and there's obviously a huge investment into science and technology. But as we all know in the game we play, it's not where you write, how many times you write, but are you cited? Citation, as we all know, becomes a measure of, of are you important and influential? Now, I think there's a lot of nonsense in this, I agree with that. But nonetheless, if we use citation, again, when I looked through a whole bunch of statistics on, on higher education, what was quite interesting was the extraordinary amount, the extraordinary degree, actually, today, even today, still, the, the highest cited articles in science and technology are still coming out of American universities. By an by enormous degree. Not even, there's not even anywhere close. There's not even anywhere close to American universities. Something in the order of 60 to 70% going up of the highest cited articles in science and technology. And by the way, we also know that, if we were honest, in international relations as well. The, 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 you know, it, it, it's less an American discipline IR. We know that. But it's still very much shaped by debates that go on in the United States. And again, that does seem to me a kind of important way of measuring what we mean by influence. What we mean, you know, who you read, what you read, and why you read it, for what reasons do you read it, and why do you think it's important to read it. Now, that may be linguistically biased towards English language stuff, and I accept that, but nonetheless, it does tell me something else. Moreover, when you go to China, one thing I did find out in China, it's not a secret after all, is how many new me members of the new bourgeoisie, as they call them, new middle classes, how many of those, uh, although they will obviously try and get their kids into the top universities in China, Beida, particularly Xinhua, for engineering, nonetheless, how many of them are trying to send their kids, their children, to foreign universities? It's quite interesting. Over 200,000 per annum are now leaving China to study abroad. And interestingly, where do they want to go? First choice, always the United States. Second choice, any other English any other English speaking country which will want me or have me or I can afford, <laughs> uh, which actually makes the UK rather adv advantageously play, placed in terms of in terms of this kind of game. So the educational destination of choice tells us something too about what I think is power. 
I'd also raise this question again, and we can come back onto this in more detail in the Q&A, Adam, about the question of American decline. Here I come back to what I call my, my, my kind of, not fixation, that'd be a pretty, pretty weird way of putting it, but my kind of, <laughs> I'm still convinced by Susan Strange. I, mean, I don't know if most of you would have met Susan Strange. But Susan Strange was also engaged in a big debate in the late 70s, early 80s on the question of American decline uh, against a number of writers at the time. And she wrote a number of articles, which I think is still actually stand up, although, I mean, many years later, I think that's, you know, you've got to add, add a, a new empirics to what she was arguing then. But she kind of made this argument about structural power. And in a way, I, I suppose I call this a little bit really strange power, or the power of strange. Um, I still think that many of the things that she argued still, you know, make a lot of sense today when we're actually talking about the United States and whether or not we do think it's in decline. Uh, I noticed this morning, by the way, on the radio, there's a rather bra brash announcement on, on, on today program saying, big military power shift from west to east. That's what it said this morning. Oh. <laughs> so I thought, I better go and have a quick look at this before I come up to Birmingham. You know, I, want to be, I want to really be hot. You know? <laughs> Didn't want to kind of think you're getting second-hand stuff here, you know. So I actually went and looked at the damn report. Now, of course it did show that the Chinese are, you know, they're increasing their military capabilities. They just bought a clap, they bought a, they bought a clapped out old Soviet uh, aircraft carrier and it took them one, 10 years to modernize, by the way. Um, they got one, America's got 11. I don't want to be you know, boring about numbers, but it does make a difference. Um, actually, when you actually look <laughs> beyond the kind of headline uh, which is very common. Here's the headline. Military power shifting from west to east. Reinforces the argument. When you dig down into the empirics, what does it still show? The United States military spending, and as we all know, anybody who studies American foreign policy knows this, it's so overwhelmingly dominant. It's the only global military power. I mean, I don't want to go into all the stuff, but it's, it's pretty damned obvious. I mean, when you kind of look even at the military balance between China and the United States, as the Chinese say to you, why are the Americans getting so upset? You know, they spend actually in purely, purely dollar terms, not a qualitative issue here, 14 to 1 more than us. Um, and as, of course, European military spending is going down, therefore, American military spending in, in, uh, in relative terms has been actually going up. The other thing, of course, raises the whole question of alliances. I mean, you know, for whatever set of reasons, and we could talk about theories of alliances if you want to, but just talking about it empirically, the United States has had a rare capacity historically to, to create sets of alliances, and still does. Uh, now, whether it does it for economic reasons, cultural reasons, soft power reasons, all sorts of other reasons, empire by invitation, if you want to do Western Europe, because nobody, people worry about China and the Cold War, or Japan, you know, whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm not worried about the deeper causes of this. Simply add up the system of alliances the United States still possesses even after the end of the Cold War. It is still pretty formidable. Now, whether everybody is following America quite so enthusiastically as they once did before, we know there are, there are kind of real problems in this alliance, like Turkey. Uh, public opinion in the Middle East is hardly pro-American in that, in, in, and of course in places like Pakistan which is the formal alliance of America it's it deeply antipathetic to the United States but the formal alliances still tell a story so when you actually take the strange measurements that is to say military power alliances and then add to that dollar power um, a colleague of mine I've edited a book with on US foreign policy Doug Stokes has just I think written a terrific piece on dollar power and his argument still is that, whichever one you can have a look at the argument to see his argument, because he goes into much more detail, the dollar still remains the most universal important currency in the world. Um, and, and of course, gives to the United States huge, huge advantage. If you print your own currency and everybody else has to have it, <laughs> that does give to you some important advantages, particularly when the Chinese possess so many dollars, there's nothing else they can do with them other than to buy the US debt. In other words, the United States has an enormous capacity to get others to pay for its own debt. Um, you can go into that in a bit more detail. Very quickly to, to, to add up a few other things, just very fast, maybe I spent too much on the first, but just to kind of throw the things up. The notion of an Asian century, which is also now becoming quite an interesting and influential in the discourse. Of course it's imitating the whole argument put in 1941 by Henry Luce, namely this American century. And that's what Luce argued back in 1941 and that notion of American century. So, it's not going to be the American century, it's going to be the Asian century. Well, nobody doubts that there are some dynamics in the, in the, in the Asian economies. And that's, been, that's actually been true for, for many years, not just over the last five or ten. 
but I just try and think a little bit more, what exactly does it mean to say an Asian century? I mean, firstly, it implies a kind of, a, or does, it, it kind of suggests that Asia is an entity. Uh, I have very grave doubts about that calling Asia an entity, largely because the divisions between Asian powers actually strike me as being as significant, if not more so, than what holds them together. I mean, because we all know from our good old IR stuff, why is there no NATO in Asia? Well, for good reason. You know, why is there, why is there, why, why are history questions, I memory, still so prevalent in Asia, dividing Asians from Asians? Very, very important. Why is there such deep suspicion still for all sorts of reasons, of Japan in Asia. Uh, wars past and not so long ago still divide Asians. In some senses, as, uh, as Sicario once put it, Asia actually is a Western construct. <laughs> in some senses, it may exist as a kind of regional thing, but does it exist as, as, as an entity with its own volition and with its own dynamic and its own kind of end notion that it's, it's there? I, 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 I actually generally don't believe so. Moreover, and again this does need to be stressed, out, other than China, um, and North Korea obviously, which is, which is, which is, its, own, is its own kind of problem, it, most of the key Asian countries are allied to the United States. So to kind of argue that it's an Asian century which is emerging kind of as some people argue it, kind of implies that Asia's rising, the West and America are declining. Whereas in fact most of these Asian countries, even if they're developing economically, are still developing very clearly within the security framework, which is still provided and can only be provided, and will only be provided into the future by the United States. Uh, this is why Obama was in Asia recently. Simply through, he wasn't going back to Asia. This is nonsense. He wasn't returning to Asia, as people have been saying. He was simply restating where America has been for the last 40, 50 years in Asia, with key security relationships still with Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and increasing, by the way, a number of communist countries, such as Vietnam. And also, by the way, um, with still an important partnership still with China. Moreover, what is interesting about China's rise, and I think this is a huge problem for it, and we've seen this over the last few years, that China's economic rise, which has benefited its neighbours, has also frightened them. You know, the paradox of China's rise. Uh, I had a, a Chinese colleague yesterday from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or maybe the International Department of the Party, I can't remember which. It doesn't really matter, because broadly speaking, I'll say the same thing. Um, but one of her points was, why do our neighbours suspect us so much? It isn't fair. We've done so much from China to raise living standards, increase markets, open up China to blah, blah, blah. You know, we got them out of the 1998 financial crisis in East Asia in 99, which is published. Why aren't they grateful? You know, why don't they follow us? more. But one of the consequences of Asia's rise, and particularly some of its policies over the last few years, has been to create very nervous neighbours. In fact, the, 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 the woman yesterday called, used a very interesting name, the nervous neighbour syndrome. The nervous neighbour syndrome. And the paradox of an economic rise which benefits the region, including Japan, but actually increases the sense of threat. So it also draws the United States back into the region, uh, if ever there was a doubt about it ever being there. The other point I'd like to make, and we can talk about this maybe in the q and is the whole question of the transatlantic, the notion of transatlantic irrelevance, <laughs> um, which I think is creeping into the debate. You know, Europe is no longer interesting, the transatlantic is no longer central, it's no longer the axis. Frankly, if you look, <laughs> NATO, for all sorts of its weaknesses, still remains the most central military alliance the United States has. The Europeans still remain, for all sorts of reasons, and David has written about this, uh, David Dunn, that is, uh, and the Europeans still retain a relationship with the United States, which is in, in some sense qualitatively different still, I think, maybe changing, but I still think it's there. Moreover, I think the transatlantic relationship, actually, if you look at it in purely economic terms, still remains fundamentally important to the rest of the world economy. We get so hung up on how much trade is going across the Pacific, how much, you know, all, all, all that is coming in, that actually when you kind of do some really boring stuff like foreign direct investment services, all that kind of stuff, you know, regulation of financial services, insurance, all that kind of thing. Quite interesting. Actually, it's really still very transatlantic. You know, in terms of in terms of what we're 
actually talk about. So the conclusion I arrive at is this, that I think we really do have to ask some serious questions about a consensus which is emerging. Um, it isn't to deny change, but it is to question how far that change has gone. It is to ask questions about the structure of power. Why it is that many dominant Western countries, I think, are going to remain very, very powerful, and if not so dominant in the same way, still very influential into the future. Um, I think to talk of, as Martin Jakes talked to recently, and it comes out in his second edition book, of when China rules the world, I mean, you know, if, not, not only is it nonsense, frankly, although it sold him 100,000 copies of the books, well done, Martin, I don't mind, well done, wish I could do that. Um, nonetheless, it kind of adds into a, a, a kind of a debate which I think is highly problematic, because not only is it empirically challengeable, I think it has problematic foreign policy consequences, and that's where I really want to end up. I want to end up by asking three questions. Uh, and I leave them as questions rather than as statements of uh, assertions. Firstly, I, 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 the, my first question, or maybe it's more a statement, is it worries me, um, and it says something about either our discipline or the state of the world intellectual class or trendyism or whatever. I, I don't quite know what it says. I, mean, I, I just raised this. I, I can't quite put my finger on it. Why is it that so many people have accepted a thesis without properly testing it. Um, because they haven't. You know, they, they simply bought into a notion based on a set of, a, a, a reasonable evidential basis without, in a sense, testing it fully. I mean, even on my crude ways of measuring economies, like the power of the importance of the transatlantic economy, still the fundamental power of the American economy. Uh, all these kinds of things do point to them, and the qualitatively higher level of these economies, frankly, uh, than many of the other economies we've been talking about. Secondly, I do worry, but this is more a worry, maybe not a question again, I do worry that economists are playing a central role in all of this. And I think we kind of, kind of try to reinsert some, some more international relations back into this um, about what we mean by power as opposed to production of cement. <coughs> or, you know, I think we do need to kind of get back into you know, you know, some old-fashioned stuff, but you know, to break down what we actually mean by power and a shift and what that shift really means. That's what I'm really trying to get at. The other thing is it brings me back to Nick Wheeler, as all, all, all of my lectures always come back to Nick. Um, what I think is especially worrying, if I might put it like this, it goes back to the great book that Nick and Ken did uh, on the security dilemma, and it was a great book, uh, by far and away the best things that have been written on that ever. Um, it's true, and you can pay me later, Nick. Um, I think it is especially worrying when it comes to the US and China. I suppose that's my argument. Part of my background is in the Cold War and trying to debunk notions of the Soviet threat. Um, there's part of me which is still back there, which sort of says hyperbole about constructing the other as enemy, and in its own way, not entirely, added to, to the Cold War and the militarization of international relations and all the rest of it. And so part of me is back there thinking about this, actually, to be honest with you. And I think there's an enormous amount of hyperbole, actually, to be honest, on China. Which, by the way, I find most Chinese don't accept them by into, uh, except the most out-and-out you know, -out patriots and nationalists. And they're not actually central to the Chinese elite, actually, e even, even today. And of course it then leads to the danger, and it, it, it may well be in the end, Nick, that um, you know, the pure power of capitalist interdependence will resolve this problem. Because the levels of interdependence now between China and the United States, Asia and the United States, are so great, that all of this kind of foreign policy stuff will be rendered uh, more or less irrelevant. But it does seem to me there is, and we've seen this over the last few years, the very real danger of a genuine security dilemma emerging on the, on the question. On the question. Now, not amongst business people, but it's not business people that in the end determine foreign policy, actually. Um, you know, if one looks at the Republican debate today about China, it's kind of full of China threat. It's full of China threat. Now, of course, the, you know, business interest may overcome that, and in India, when they get to power, they find out how much investment they got in there and how much. American economy is dependent on China and all have to go back to something realistic, the very heart of the system. That's true. That's true. 
But there is, it seems to me, and I'm not saying Organsk is right, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be arguing that, but I do think that the danger of a problematic analysis, it could lead to some problematic international outcomes. Uh, I suppose part of what I'm trying to do isn't just an empirical, an empirical attempt to kind of rethink or challenge a standard thesis, it is also to think through some of the consequences of buying into this thesis, what I'm positive. I'll end there. Thank you very much indeed.